All right, I think we are live. <clears throat> so we'll start in a minute. <clears throat> All right, uh, it's 11.30, we can uh, start now. <clears throat> Hello everyone and a warm welcome to the second installment of the Fall 2022 Distinguished Theme Seminar Series organized by the Department of Statistics at Purdue University. This year's theme is Recent Advances in Statistical Inference. A big shout out to the Theme Seminar Committee for organizing this series. My name is Ontik Chakraborty. I'm an assistant professor in the department. Before we be begin the sem seminar, here are a few announcements. This seminar series is going to be live streamed on our department's YouTube channel. The URL is www.youtube.com slash C slash Purdue University Statistics. Before we begin the seminar, we remind those of you watching on Zoom to please keep your microphones muted at all times unless you are actively asking a question. If you're watching on YouTube, you can submit any questions you have in the chat and we will forward them to the speaker. Professor Candace has generously agreed to have a 30 minute session with our students after the seminar. So students, please stay on after the seminar is over. Please note that this session is not going to be live streamed on YouTube. So please use the Zoom link. <clears throat> Today, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Emmanuel Candace from Stanford University. Professor Candace is the Burnham Simons Chair in Mathematics and Statistics, a professor of electrical engineering by courtesy and a member of the Institute of Computational and Mathematical Engineering at Stanford University. Earlier, Professor Candace was the Ronald and Maxine Linde Professor of Applied and Computational Mathematics at the California Institute of Technology. His research interests are in computational harmonic analysis, statistics, information theory, signal processing, and mathematical optimization with applications to the imaging sciences, scientific computing, and inverse problems. He received his PhD in statistics from Stanford University in 1998. Professor Candace has received several awards, including the Alan T. Waterman Award from NSF, which is the highest honor bestowed by the National Science Foundation and which recognizes the achievements of early career scientists. He has given over 60 plenary lectures at major international conferences, not only in mathematics and statistics, but in many other areas as such as in biomedical imaging and solid state physics. He was elected to the National Academy of Sciences and to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2014. Today, Professor Candace is going to talk about conformal prediction in 2022. We are honored to have Professor Candace joining us here today, and let's give him our full attention. Professor Candace, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Antik, for the kind introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be here and a very pl great pleasure to talk to you about conformal prediction or conformal inference. Um, I prepared this lecture with a bit of a tutorial uh, mindset in mind. Um, the goal of this lecture is perhaps not to give you a sense of what I've done lately, but to expose you to a new field of research called conformal inference. And if this lecture achieves anything, it will be, I hope, a perfect setup for a, a talk you'll have later in the quarter uh, given by Rena Barber, where she will present a very recent work in this area. So... Um, um, so I think I don't need to tell you that machine learning is being deployed in very critical applications nowadays. Um, you know, when I started uh, my career, you know, the kind of typical applications of machine learning might be the Netflix prize. And honestly, whether you get it wrong or right or wrong, it doesn't matter. But today we use machine learning in very important um, problems such as self-driving cars to issue medical diagnostics. And really, these are applications that are extremely important, where the cost of being wrong can be extremely high. So we want to use uh, data and algorithms to make decisions. And the question that we want to ask in this lecture is whether we can have confidence in these machine learning predictions. Because I'm not going to go through uh, a lot of slides here, but you know, we all know that you know neural nets tend to be a bit overconfident about their predictions. So when you deploy neural networks in situations where the cost of being wrong is high, uh, you might be, um, it might be extremely problematic. 
At the same time, you know, I think things that I will not discuss, but which is actually conform, uh, related to the topics that we'll explore today is the fact that when we deploy algorithms that impact people's lives, we have to be extremely careful about biases that these algorithms might in, imply or a form of status quo that may become the norm. And so certainly uh, we need great awareness around the use of machine learning uh, to make, uh, to inform uh, decisions that will impact our lives. So it seems to me that since this uh, theme, this series is about inference, uh, I would like to pose an inference question. And it's an inference question which might not be of exactly the kind that you're used to uh, for a very simple reason. Uh, we uh, may hy hypothetically declare that, you know, there are many, many uh, candidates applications to Stanford each year for um, undergraduate admission. And, you know, it's not inconceivable that in the near future, we'll sort of outsource some of the sorting to uh, a machine learning algorithm, which might predict how well students would do if admitted to Stanford. And we can imagine having a black box that would perhaps output a prediction, such as a GPA after two years of education at Stanford. But honestly, a point estimate like this, a Y hat, if you will, like this, uh, is of little um, use to a decision maker because really, you know, there's tremendous uncertainty about this precision, about these uh, predictions. And so I think what we would like, the inference question we would like to pose in this lecture is why is it that we don't see prediction intervals more often? And so prediction interval, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about is about prediction intervals is a set C constructed from past data such that if I observe the covariate X, then the label Y unknown to me is guaranteed to fall in the prediction range 90% of the time. So it is not a confidence interval because it is not about a parameter in a model that may or may not exist in real life. It is actually something very real and that's why I like this field very much which is I'm actually asking you to give me a predicted range for the unknown label. And so if we can do something like this, then we can actually tell decision makers with confidence what we've learned from past data and how capable is algorithm at, uh, at, at making predictions. Of course, why prediction intervals might not be very useful, but that might be because we've not learned so much from past data and short intervals might be quite informative. Now, we don't see prediction intervals very often in the literature, and I think that's a real shame. Um, we just see point estimates or predictions. And why and of the reason we might not see um, prediction intervals is that we're way past simple regressions. Um, people use extremely complicated models uh, to fit data, you know, and so you see I mean, perhaps the two popular one, most popular ones, Neural nets and XGBoost, um, and you know, even in simple regression model, you know, it's already a bit hairy to get prediction intervals correctly, and so you can imagine that it's completely impossible when we have systems this complex. But yet, we will see that it is possible. That no matter what machine algorithm you use, it is possible under minimal assumptions to make uh, to actually construct meaningful prediction intervals. So I'd like to set up uh, what we're going to talk about during this hour. And so um, just to make it uh, simple, we're going to assume that we have training data, x1, y1, through x and y1, yn, sorry, and a test point xn plus 1. And I don't observe the label yn plus 1. I'm going to assume that the data is exchangeable. Exchangeability, I'm sure people in statistics know what that means. It's more general than being IID. So I'm going to assume the data is exchangeable from a distribution P of X, Y. And what's going to be remarkable about these lectures, we're going to make no assumption about P of X, Y whatsoever. And the goal of prediction, predictive inference, of model-free predictive inference, is on the, to use the training data to actually construct a prediction interval for the unknown label such that it covers the unknown label 90% of the time or 95% of the time, whatever fraction you want, 
And again, I want to emphasize that we want to make no distributional assumption about P of X, Y, and it should hold no matter the sample size. And so the first time you look at something like this, it says, well, it can be done. And we'll see that in fact, it can be done and it can be done quite nicely. And so what we want to be able to say when we actually work in this area of inference is we want to say, well, based on the candidate's high school identifiers, her GPA, her SAT scores, whether she engaged in extracurricular activities and so on, I'm predicting the college GPA to be in that range. And that prediction needs to be correct 90% of the time. That's what we are after. So how would we predict with confidence if, um, if that's a goal? Well, a very naive approach, and here I'm, so I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, again, you know, remember that my goal is to be a bit tutorial in nature. Um, a naive approach might be to build a predictive model, let's say a neural net or XGBoost. And so I have some data and I look at the residual that is a misfit between the observed data, the training data and the curves that I'm feeding. And this can be as complex as you want. Look at the histogram of the residuals, which you know is the thing that you see on the, on the right. And then, uh, you know, a naive approach, a naive way of predicting, uh, of constructing a, a prediction band would be to use our regression function, however complicated, and add or subtract a quantile of the residuals. And that would be uh, a very bad thing to do because we know, and that's what we have attested, that it doesn't work. That in general, the residuals are much smaller on the training point than on the test points. Of course, we all know that it's extreme for neural nets because for neural nets, you would actually interpolate the data most of the time, in which case, you know, your prediction band would have zero widths and who can believe this? Uh, there are methods that goes around this. A jackknife might look better, but it actually fails as well. And so, um, and so what, sh what shall we do about this? Well, this is where uh, this wonderful field of conformal prediction enters the picture. Uh -huh. We're going to see that predictive inference is possible under no assumptions whatsoever. Uh, this is a field that I think is fascinating, that changed my uh, work quite a bit. Uh, and is largely due to the work of Vladimir Foff since the early 2000s. And, uh, you know, on this slide, I put a, 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 a important references. And so this is really a wonderful field. And, 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 and Vladimir is a, certainly a hero of mine. And I, I feel we owe him a, a great deal of intellectual gratitude. Um, in the statistics community, uh, some people played a key role, uh, Jing Lei and Larry Wasserman. Uh, I started to diffuse the ideas and, of course, develop ideas on their own uh, about conformal prediction, and they played a very important role uh, in the field, and we also owe them a great deal of gratitude. And finally, I owe a great deal of gratitude to three collaborators with whom I, I worked a lot on this field. I'm not going to tell you about our joint work in this area, again, because the goal of this lecture is to be fairly uh, tutorial in nature, but I know that you'll hear from Rina in a few weeks, and so you, you'll have a chance um, to hear from about our joint work. Okay, so how does conformal prediction looks like? There are lots of pictures in this talk and not, many, not much math, so I hope you'll forgive me for that. But the main idea is to look at holdout residuals. And so conformal prediction comes in several flavor. We're gonna look at the easy one first, and then perhaps at the one that is a little bit more involved next. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at holdout residuals. And so you give me a data set, and I hope you can see my screen correctly. What I'm going to do is I'm going to split the data at random between what I'm going to call a real training split and a calibration split. So here the training split is in black, and the calibration split is in blue. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to fit a model. Uh, and again, that can be how however complicated this is, this could be a neural net or XG boost or whatever, I'm gonna fit a model to the training split, to the training, the black points. And then I'm gonna look at the holdout residuals and I'm gonna look at the magnitude of the residuals. Okay, and these are the residuals on the holdout set. So these are points that I were not used to fit the data. 
And what I can look at is I can then look at the magnitude of these residuals and look at the 90th percentile of the magnitude of the residuals. And I can draw a band around a, a yellow band um, with a 90th percentile. So, so basically I'm looking at the 90th largest value of the absolute residuals. And then I'm drawing a band with that width around the regression function that I fitted. And if you follow what I'm saying is because the holdout set is a representative sample of future data points, then what we know by definition is that about 90% of future test points will fall within this band. And here the key argument is that the holdout data points are exchangeable with the future test points. And so a future test point is equally likely or not than a holdout data point to be in the band. And so what that means is if I were to take Q to be the 19th percentile of the absolute residuals on the calibration set, which were not used for model fitting, then you know it's two lines of, of reasoning that would show you that then it must be that the test, the label YN plus one will actually belong to the predictive band with, with chance at least 90%. And this is a fundamental result uh, published in 2002. And so what's kind of remarkable about this is I've not made no assumption except the assumption of having exchangeable data. I never ask you about the distribution of P. I never ask you anything about the sample size. I never ask you anything about the algorithm you fit and this would always work. And so we know how to construct predictive intervals. Uh, and I hope this is clear. Um, I don't know uh, if, if people want to ask questions, it's a good time to ask questions if people have questions, but you can see it's, it, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Now, okay, no, so now, um, so we know how to construct predictive intervals. Now, you know, we know that it's possible. And now is this the question that we want to ask is, is this the way we should do it? And well, what we've been looking at is if you look at a bit, if you put in a little, um, with just tiny bit of math notation, what we've just done is we use the function S of X, Y, which we call a conformity score in the field, which is here is simply the um, absolute values of the residuals. That is uh, the magnitude of Y minus the fitted uh, uh, value. And then the predictive set C of X is simply these points such that the conformity scores are below the 90th percentile. Uh, Professor Candice, there is yes. a question in the chat. Yeah. Question is, are we assuming that the mean regression model is Y is equal to a mean plus some error? Is that- No, no, there's no assumption about P of X, Y. This will always work. Absolutely. No, that's a good question. We're not assuming anything. In particular, we are not assuming that, for example, we're not assuming even a non-parametric model with homoscedastic noise. And that is going to be important for what's coming up later. This is always works, no matter the generating distribution X, Y. And is the division between the model fitting or the test uh, training set and the calibration set, is it done randomly or? Yes, it is done at random. It's extremely important that it be done at random. Okay. Mm -hmm. And one more question, I think. How big does the calibration set have to be? Okay, that's a very good question. That's a trade-off. Um, of course, the calibration set is used to learn the quantiles of the conformity scores. And of course, we want a, a lot of data points in the, in the training set to get a good model mu hat, right? So it's a trade-off. The thing is, if you make the calibration too small, you can see that this variable Q, which is a this random variable Q, which is a 90th percentile, may be extremely volatile. So while you might get good marginal coverage, condition on the split, you might not, you know, you might not be very good. And so uh, there are papers, and I can at the end of the talk, I can point the audience to papers exploring, you know, what's a good trade-off between training and calibration. The thing that is important though, is that in a few slides, we're gonna remove this distinction between calibration 
and, and training. Okay. There is one more comment. Uh, the comment is, uh, it says that looks like the band is too narrow at some places and too wide elsewhere. Okay, well, the bandwidth is always the same. So maybe that's an optical illusion. No, it's always the same if you look at it. So please, the bandwidth, yeah, you're right. So, okay, first the width of the yellow is the same, no matter what, where, but you're right that maybe here it's a bit too small and here it's a bit too large. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Yes, All right. thank, thank you. you, very good comment. Okay. All right, so, so, so just to go back to where we were, you know, we, we, we basically construct a predictive band which are all the wires such that the conformity score is less than the 90th percentile of the conformity scores on the calibration set. And so why stop here? We could use any conformity scores. And if I use any conformity scores, if I score each point according to perhaps not just the magnitude of the residual, but other scores, I mean, basically the entire thing goes through, which is that, you know, if you look at this, uh, what's, you know, if I were to actually uh, construct a predictive band that consists of the Y so that S of X, Y is below the quantile of the conformity scores in the calibration set, then the exact same argument, the exact argument of exchangeability would apply. And it would say that Y belongs to the predictive interval with probability at least 90%. And so now I'm going to, uh, on TIC, I'm going to uh, address one of the comments that was just made, which is that here is an artificial data set that we created with Yaniv Romano, where in blue, you see actually the true conditional quantiles of the distribution of Y given X. And um, what you can see here is, I think, the, the argument that I just heard in the chat, which is that I can see that the data, the variance of the noise, if you will, is not homoscedastic. There are regions where the width of the distribution is smaller than in other places. And yet the kind of prediction interval that we're building, which is the pink area, has constant width around the um, estimated mean function, which you see in black, which was in this case uh, fitted by a random forest. And we can see that somehow they are, the point that was very good and was made, which is that sometimes the width is too small, sometimes it's too large. And so it doesn't seem to work that well. Now, of course, marginally it does what we want, but conditionally it doesn't. And so this is why, you know, once you look at conformal prediction and when you say, well, I could actually construct any conformity score I might like, you might actually uh, think a little bit about uh, other ways of fitting, of constructing prediction bands that are completely different from what you've just seen. And so we're gonna see a, a method that we develop uh, called conformalized quantile regression. I'm gonna call it, it CQR um, uh, for short. And you know, here, just to show you the, the difference between the two ways of that building valid prediction bands, you know, in the left, you have what we've just seen. And so it's essentially a band around the conditional mean, estimated conditional mean of constant widths. And you can see that in blue, it's completely different. In fact, we're gonna see that the widths of the prediction intervals varies depending on where you are in space. And so as a result, because the blue uh, prediction band, which has coverage 91%, uh, which is exactly what you want, uh, is more adaptive, it seems to be way more adaptive to where you are in space. As a result, its length is, is much shorter. The average length of the prediction interval on the right is 2.18, whether on the left it's 2.91. And so just to play a bit with ideas of conformal prediction, we're gonna see how we constructed this nice band that we see on the right. And this is really conformal inference at play, which is like as a statistician or data scientist, you have the luxury of designing the conformity scores and how are we going to design them in this, in, this, um, in this lecture or in this example I just gave? Well, what we're going to do is, you know, really what conformal prediction is about is trying to understand what are the quantiles of Y given X? What is the 95th percentile? What is the 5th percentile? 
And so one thing I never understood about the method that people use to, to, to construct prediction interval is if you're interested in the quantiles of y given x, why do you start by estimating the mean? And so here, what we're going to do is we're going to put, put two fields together. On the one hand, we're going to put quantile regression, which has no guarantees of any kind. And then we're going to put conformal prediction, which will tell us exactly how to conformalize quantile regression to get all the guarantees we want. And so uh, this slide is a bit packed, but this is what we're trying to do is we're going to, again, we're discussing split conformal. We can see that we can apply the CQR algorithm in split and full conformal mode. And I'll explain the full conformal mode in a minute. But what we're doing now is we use our training data to actually not fit the mean function, but rather we fit the quantize. And this is done by just changing the loss in your, in, in your machine learning algorithm to not the squared loss, but something that is called a pinball loss. And by setting alpha to be 0.05, we're finding the fifth percentile. By setting alpha to be 0.95, we're finding the 95th percentile. And therefore, you can use your XGBoost or neural nets or whatever to find a fifth and 95th percentile. And of course, this quantile function that you see pictured on the left, on the right, will be uncalibrated. They, nothing says that they will have 90% coverage from now on. And so that's why you conformalize. And now the conformity score we're going to use is this funny function, which I'm going to explain graphically in a minute. We're going to look at the distance on the calibration set between, on the holdout set, between the Ys and the fitted quantiles. And we're going to use these distances to conformalize and move these quantiles a bit so then they have the prescribed coverage. And so this is exactly an algorithm that looks exactly like what we've seen with the definition of the conformity score in this fashion, then we're going to include y in a predictive interval if y, s of the conformity score evaluated at y is less than the quantile of the calibration conformity scores. And so to unpack this a little bit, you know, so you know, we have the training and calibration set. We fit the quantiles using your favorite algorithm on the left. And then we look at the calibration set on the right. And we're going to assign each point on the right a conformity score. And that conformity score is just going to be, in this case, the distance to the nearest quantile with a plus sign if you're outside of the predictive band and a minus sign if you're inside the predictive band. So points outside of the prediction, predictive band receive a positive score and point inside receive a negative score. All right. And then we're going to do exactly uh, what I just said. Each calibration point receives the conformity score that we see at the top, the sign distance to the nearest quantile. I'm going to take the quantile of these conformity scores, and then I'm going to include, if you show me xn plus 1, I'm going to include y in the predictive band if the conformity score evaluated at xn plus 1 and y is less than the quantile of the conformity scores. And now in this case, it takes a very simple form. It means that you're gonna move up and down your quantiles by this Q, which is a quantile of the conformity scores. And so this is very intuitive. It means that if in the calibration set, you did a, on a training set, you fit very good quantiles. Let's say you got the Oracle quantiles, the true quantiles. Then of course, you know, about 10% of the point on the calibration set will lie outside, 90% would lie inside, and therefore Q might be zero or very close to zero, and you would not change your conformity scores. If on the other hand, there were too many points outside, then Q becomes positive and you enlarge your prediction band. If on the other hand, uh, Q, uh, the, there were too few points outside, you'd say, well, I've been too conservative, and you would actually shrink the predictive band. And so uh, when you apply this algorithm on the same data set that you've seen before, then it tends to produce bands like this, which is you fit your quantiles and then you calibrate them to put them at the right place. Okay, so uh, this is something that uh, works very well in practice. I've been told that it's been implemented in a lot of different applications. Here you'll see just one application, which is to try to predict um, healthcare system utilization, and it's been measured by the number of, of visits to a doctor's office and the hospital. 
And then you have lots of caveats of interest. You have your age, your marital status, your race, your poverty status, your health status, the kind of insurance you have, and so on. And so this is a data set that is quite rich. It has 16,000 subjects and 140 features, and you try to predict how much any individual is going to use a healthcare system. Professor and Kent, so, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. There is a question uh, from the audience. So yeah. the question is, if there are repeated holdout test sets, is there a handle on the variability of the width of the prediction intervals? Well, the, the width of the prediction interval will be very, very the, the, the variance of the width of the prediction interval will depend on the number of points in the tests in the calibration set, right? The fewer, the higher the variance. And that's why there's this tension between you want a large, you want a large uh, training set so that you can fit a good model, so you can fit good quantize in this last example, right? But you also want a large calibration set to reduce the variance of the of your quantile estimate. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm I'm very happy to stop and entertain more questions. Um, the the um, um, the results on the on this data set I was I was showing you is that you know we can use the CQR method or just the magnitude of the residuals as conformity scores and you know we are told by theory that we should observe that well it covers ninety percent and that's what you see and that's why these plots are so uninteresting in some ways that you want ninety percent and you get exactly ninety percent. The advantage of CQR, of course, in this example, is that on this real data set, the width of the CQR intervals is much lower than the width of the uh, traditional method. So it's because the algorithm is far more adaptive than the traditional method. And one thing that I think your the audience asked about is that in terms of conditional coverage, and I don't want to get into how we define conditional coverage here, but also the conditional coverage, which we cannot guarantee, by the way, uh, of the CQR algorithm is much higher than that of the traditional method, because of course we're building intervals that are far more adaptive than uh, the traditional method. So there's a lot of richness here. Like now you have a recipe for constructing prediction interval and your goal as a statistician is to come up with uh, informative uh, uh, non-conformity scores so that you can build good prediction intervals and, and CQR is certainly a step in the right direction. Okay. I've talked a lot about uh, continuous variables, but of course, you know, in as you know, in machine learning, uh, a lot of times the label is discrete. You know, it might be an object class. It might be uh, something which is unordered. And so, um, you know, you can also apply conformal prediction to give predicted prediction sets for categorical labels. So let me explain how that might work. Again, I want to be extremely modern and, sh and show how this can play with uh, the most sophisticated uh, algorithm that people can use. So let's say I have a neural net that produces class probabilities or label Y given X, right? So, you know, let's say this would be typically your soft max layer in a neural net architecture. And so now, you know, I have, uh, you present me an X and I need to find a class label. And I'm looking at the soft max layer of my neural net. And I say, well, I see 50%, you know, is that 50% chance of being A, 30% of being B, 10% of being C and so on. And I might make an uncalibrated guess, which is that, well, I'm gonna actually put together the most likely class label such that the total mass is 90%. In which case I would actually uh, put together ABC. But this is of course uncalibrated. And as I've said before, your neural net architecture might be just too sure about itself. So this would not have validity on unseen samples. And so to just to understand how we can use conformal prediction to do this, um, and this is uh, work we've done with uh, Yaniv Romano and Matteo Cesia, um, what you can do is you could say, all right, I'm gonna have a parameter here that I'm gonna try to calibrate. And the, calibrate, the parameter, I wanna make this very intuitive. 
is as follows. The parameter that I'm going to try to calibrate is this parameter tau, which is what nominal level do you want to achieve? And so what my plot before was showing you is that if I actually, you know, put in my prediction bag, you know, I want to say, how far should you go to put items in your prediction bag? Should you go to 90%? And what we see on this plot is, well, no, because 90%, when I look at my holdout data set, would only achieve 85%. So now what you need to imagine that there's a curve where you're going to propose, should you go to 95%? Should you go to 97%? And so on the calibration set, what you're going to do is you're going to fit a curve where the x-axis is how far should you go. On the y-axis is the realized coverage on your, on your calibration set. And here we would see that if I go to 95%, then on my calibration set, I achieve 90%. And now, and it's, I'm not saying it's immediate because it is not. You need to kind of write down a few things, but now this is a conformal method. That is, if you say, well, my prediction set is I'm gonna rank the items by decreasing conditional probabilities fitted by my neural net. And I'm not going to go until 95% because 95% is what achieves 90% on the calibration set. Then this method will achieve 90% coverage period. And so you see, you can do, you can do quanti you, it's, a, it's a form of quantile regression for, for categorical uh, data. And it will actually produce valid prediction intervals. And so, you know, here are some examples. This, as I said, this is used a lot these days. In fact, the algorithm you've just seen is used a lot. And so, you know, this is an example of running this on some data. And so on the left, you see a squirrel. And then in this case, the prediction set is very simple. It says the thing is very, after calibration, you know, it's a fox squirrel. Here is like, okay, the middle image, it's like perhaps a bit more difficult example. And then the prediction set might, will be, well, you know, four, four possibilities. And in the right, you know, this is a, a yet something that is a bit more difficult. And then in this case, the algorithm will be honest about what it thinks it is. And it, 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 the prediction set will have only six possibilities out of thousand, of course. And so this is how this might work in practice. Okay. Um, I don't know how am I doing on time. I, I can take questions if there are any. Uh, otherwise, uh, I want to show you full conformal. Okay, so let me just talk to you about full conformal, which is really exciting. Um, um, so I think I think people alluded to this that you know we might split the data in two halves, a, a training set and a calibration set, but you know in many ways this might be seem wasteful. And uh, we're going to see today uh, one way of not doing this split, and this is called full conformal where we're gonna use all the data points simultaneously for training and validation. Now, this might not be the, you'll see that there are, computer, there are computational limitations to running full conformal and perhaps also some statistical limitations, which perhaps I can talk about with the students. Um, and so we've built the alternative called Jackknife Plus and CV Plus, which I will unfortunately not talk about today. So, you know, in being faithful to the tutorial nature of this lecture, uh, let's look at how full conformal works. And now we're going to have no distinction between the training point and the calibration point. So what we're going to do is, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to iterate through, you know, so there is a, a value, let's say the blue, do you see my hand on the screen here? You know, I need to construct a prediction interval at xn plus one equals 4.8. How am I going to do this? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to basically try to say, is this red dot, is this value in red, should it be in the prediction interval or not? And here's how we're going to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to fit a model with all the training samples and xn plus one and the hypothesized value of little y. That is, 
the hypothesized value of little y is now part of the feeding model, of the fitted model. And then we compute residuals. And then we can see, is the red residual, does it conform to other residuals? That is, what's its p-value? Like in terms of ranking, how large it is compared to other residual. And here we can see that it's at the 73 percentile of the other residuals in magnitude. And so that's not an unusual residual. And so now we can move y up and we refit the model and we have another p-value. And then we could fit y up, we can meet y up and we have another p-values. And so we propose candidates and each time we compare the magnitude of the residuals we get with the magnitude of the other residuals. Now, what's beautiful about this animation, if I may say so, is that as, you, as I move the point up, you can see that the fitted function uh, moves at the bottom. You know, you can see that it goes up because of course, Y is driving the fit. And now, you know, we keep on moving it up and now we can see that, you know, this residual is very large compared to others. So this may not be a very likely value. And so we continue, you know, we compute, we compute now, we can see that the regression function is going up, the residuals now starts to be, et cetera. And basically, if you follow what I'm doing is we're gonna, at point X, we're gonna construct a prediction interval such that the p-value is below 5%. And that is my conformity score. I'm gonna keep the y's for which the residual conform to other residuals. And, and that's gonna be um, my prediction interval. So, um, okay, so you can see the drawback and the drawback of this method, which is very appealing, is that each time I'm gonna to have to refit the model. And of course, each time I propose a value of Y, I have to refit the value, the model. And if fitting the model is expensive, this is gonna be problematic. And that's why we have these alternatives that I won't discuss today. Okay, so how does this work? Uh, conceptually, it's extremely important to understand how it works. Uh, we observe training data and a test data. And so suppose we observe the value of yn plus one. Then if I use, if I fit a model mu hat to all the data points, training and test data by a symmetric algorithm that does not, that, you know, does not use the ordering between the data points, I'm going to get residuals, y minus mu hat. And again, I'm going to te test residuals. And I hope that now you follow me that essentially, the magnitude of the test residual is, is exchangeable with the magnitude of all the residuals by exchangeability. And so Rn plus one should be, you know, there's a 90% chance that it's in within the 90th percentile of the other ones. And now what we're just doing is just saying, it says, okay, now we're gonna propose a little value of Y. We don't know what Yn plus one is. So we hypothesize a little value of Y we construct the residuals by feeding the model on, on all the data, n, x, n plus one and y. We get a residual that depends on little y. And we're gonna check if this residual is in the 90th percentile. And this is gonna be correct because if we were to impute y equals little y n plus one, then this would be within the 90th percentile, 90% of the time. And now, you know, this is a, the full conformal prediction. We propose a test value. We compute our conformity scores and we check whether uh, the conformity scores is within the 90th percentile of all other conformity scores. If yes, we include Y in the prediction interval. If no, we leave it out. And a little bit of math, not a lot actually, will show that you know, that this does what we want. And that's what's really nice about this is that we've completely blurred the distinction between the training and calibration. There is no training and calibration data point. Everything happens at once. Okay. So, and of course you can do this with CQR that, you know, you just change your conformity scores. You would fit the quantize, hypothesizing a little value of Y, and then everything is the same. Okay. Uh, Professor Candice, there is a yes. small question uh, from the audience. Uh, so, question is if the width of the width of the bands are uh, constants here. Yeah, but you could do this. You could do this with any conformity scores. 
So let's look at how it would work with CQR, okay? What you do is you, you fit the quantile function on the data that you see at the top. You compute the conformity scores exactly what I just said, the distance to the nearest quantile, and you include y in your prediction band if the conformity score for xn plus one, y is below the 90th percentile of all others. And that would create exactly what we've seen before. So you can do this with any conformity scores. Here, I just wrote it down for the residuals because conceptually I figured that this is what the audience might be most familiar with, but this works with any conformity scores whatsoever. In particular, it works for CQR. Is that, and it works for all the uh, discrete label examples we've seen before. It works no matter what. It's the same method. Okay, all right, so um, just a little application um, and then, um, and then uh, uh, it's about forecasting the 2020 US presidential election results county by county. Uh, and in fact, it's a real application of CQR uh, that was used by the Washington Post. So um, this is a map uh, county by county of the 2020 US presidential election results. And so uh, a dark blue means uh, um, basically a change in the vote for the, for the candidates from 2016 to 2020. Uh, and so dark blue would be like something like a 50% increase for the Democrat candidate. A dark red would be a 50% a increase for the Republican candidate between 2016 and 2020. And so the problem statement is as follows. You have uh, data, which is uh, XIYI for each reporting county I. And so you have county features, which are demographic variables, socioeconomic variables, and so on. And what you are interested in is you're interested in a normalized vote change. So for example, you know, we might be interested in the number of Republican or Democratic votes in a given county, in county I, let's call like RI, for example, RI20, it's the number of people we're gonna vote for the Republican candidate in 2020. And we wanna predict YI, which is a rate of change in the, in the number of votes that the Republican candidate will get between 2016 and 2020. And when you're running an election, when you're a news organization, what you wanna do is you have some counties that have reported and you wanna predict the counties that have not yet reported. And you want to do it with confidence because I don't need to tell you that the cost of being wrong here is extremely significant. And so this is what the Washington Post run. The Washington Post, believe it or not, use conformal inference to inform their readers about how the election might go uh, as the election night. And then of course the election week went on. And this is work it was done by John Cherian and Lainey Bronner. John Cherian is a PhD student of mine at Stanford and Lenny Bronner works in the data science desk at the Washington Post. And this is a snapshot about the state of Pennsylvania that I took on November 5th, 2020 at 12.50 a.m. And um, maybe I should focus more on this thing, which is at that time, uh, Trump was ahead when you were counting the number of votes. But what the Washington Post was telling its readers is that when all votes would have been tallied, then when all counties would have reported, then they were projecting that Biden would be ahead. And they did actually try to convey their uncertainty about their projections to their reader. Mm -hmm. Because if you see like the color scheme they used on the left, you know, dark blue is like sort of the median, a dark red is a median for Trump. And then as you go lower, you actually uh, get into the quantiles of the distribution. And uh, the Washington Post used this very elaborate and very nice color scheme to actually not only um, tell where they think the election is going, but also project uncertainty what they really know about the election. So um, I'm going to try to have a mock up of what the uh, scientists at the Washington Post did uh, just to show you the power of conformal prediction. Uh, in this example, I'm going to have 3,076 counties, which I'm going to split into 1,200 uh, training uh, 
counties and 1,876 counties. So I'm saying that I've seen 1,200 counties selected at random. And my job is to give you the a prediction for why for the vote for the Republican candidate in 1876 counties I have not seen yet. And I'm going to run full uh, conformal procedure, both with the linear model that we've seen, the residual conformity score, and CQR. All right, so this is, and my target is 90% coverage. And so here are my training counties uh, selected at random. These are on the left. And for all the counties that you see on the right, I'm going to try to tell you how the election is going. Okay. And I've done this a few times. So that is a few times I actually draw uh, uh, 1,200 training counties and try to call 1,876 uh, test counties. And for CQR and linear regression, I got these wonderful figures each time, which is that, you know, you want 90% coverage. I got 89.82, 89.55, 89.45 in my second round. So, you know, you can just see that the theory works out of the box. And, you know, I did this 25 times and both these algorithms have, of course, uh, the guarantees we've seen. And so I could see that you know, I get 90% all the time or between 91 and 89% pretty much all the time. And so, so this is very powerful. Uh, Professor Candice, there are a couple of questions from the yep. audience. Uh, I'd like to go. So, uh, the first question is, in this construction of confidence bands, is there any control on the width of the bands? No, I mean, you, you, now you're gonna use your conformity score, right? And your conformity score will actually give the width of the confident band. What, what we're doing, which is very interesting, I think, is we're saying, we know how to achieve a type one error. And now you are gonna design conformity scores such that the, the width is as small as possible. But that is the width you're gonna get depends on the conformity scores you get, you use. Mm -hmm. But now it's very interesting because now we can compare algorithms side by side because they're all gonna have 90% coverage. Then we might tend to prefer methods with lower interval widths. And so yeah. now we have a fair game. We have a fair comparison between, um, between algorithms because they're all prescribed to achieve exactly the same type one error. Okay, I think the next question is also kind of related to what you were just saying. So it's a question from YouTube. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the question is, would different con conformity scores result in different results, both theoretically and numerically? In no. other words, is it interesting to find a so-called optimal conformity score? Well, you have only one data set. So I don't know what it means, the optimal conformity score. I mean, to me, the optimal conformity score is really is a quantize of y given x, which I don't know what they are. But yeah, to actually find conformity score that would work well in practice in a variety of different scenarios is a, is a good research topic, absolutely. And a lot of people are looking at this now, absolutely. Okay, uh, one more question uh, from the audience. How is the method robust to the case that the test data are not distributed according to the training data, I mean, if the okay. research the... And that's an excellent question. So if I have 10 minutes still, this is what, what I was planning to do in the last 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, so, so we can see that the method works extremely well. But I'm very glad to have had this last question because that's not what happens during the election. Right? During the election, uh, counties do not report in a random order. In other words, the reporting counties, the counties that have reported by, let's say, 12 a.m. the night of the election is not representative of the outstanding counties. I mean, rural counties may be overrepresented, smaller counties may be overrepresented, counties in the eastern part of the United States may be overrepresented. And so in no way is it a representative. In other words, my counties between training and testing are not exchangeable. And so we're going to have a problem. And so um, this is what I wanted to talk to you for the last five, six minutes. Um, uh, we need to move in a little bit beyond exchangeability because the election example makes clear 
that that the counties are not are not exchangeable. And so this is what the lecture by Professor Barber will cover in details uh, two weeks from now. Uh, because I have only five minutes, uh, I'm just going to cover this in less detail. So people are developing several approaches to deal with a lack with what I'm going to call distribution of shifts. And I'm going to show you just one example, and we now will present you another example. So Barber, uh, myself, uh, Aditya Randas, and Rian Tushani, we've developed a method to deal with non-exchangeable data. Uh, this will be the, the topic of your uh, lecture series on September 23. So I invite everyone interested in these methods to attend this lecture. I will present something different, which is what we call adaptive conformal inference, which is with uh, joint with Isaac Gibbs. And here is like, you know, let's look at the election example. In the election example, we observe a data stream where XTs are the covariates, YT are the votes. And you know, I get the first county reporting and the second and so on. And perhaps the distribution of XTYT is different as PT or PT varies across time. And so at any given time, we want to kind of actually predict the next reporting county. Okay. And so we would like it to be correct if possible. So we're going to need to deal with distribution drift. And what we've seen is that the way we construct a prediction interval is by looking at putting in the prediction interval all the while so that the conformity score is below the 90th per quantile of the conformity scores I've seen so far. And what you can imagine is what makes everything works is that if the things were IID or more generally exchangeable, the empirical distribution of the quantile of the conformity scores and the future distribution of the conformity scores, they're the same. And so the empirical distribution and the true distribution will align, and that's what makes everything works. But if there's a distribution shift, then it may not be, you know, the true distribution, the empirical distribution of the conformity scores may shift to the left, or it may shift to the right. And so therefore, then now we're going to have problems. Now, how do we look, think about this in this work? We think about this as, well, we have a parameter alpha t. If things were perfect, the method would work. But now, you know, I think what we're trying to say here is if I want to build a 90% a 90% prediction interval, then maybe I should not use a 90%, the 90 percentile of the conformity score. Maybe I should use 95 because the thing has shifted to the right. Or maybe I should use 85 because the thing I've shifted to the left. And so now the key idea is, can we learn alpha T star? And <clears throat> all right. And so now this brings us, this brings together a third idea of a third field of research. You can call it control theory, or you can control, call it online learning, but we're gonna try to, we're gonna have a knob, which is alpha T which is which quantile of the conformity scores do I want to use to construct my prediction interval? And what we're saying is perhaps we should use alpha T plus one equals to alpha T plus gamma times the target minus the error, where the error is just on the past, the data I just saw, did I make a mistake or not? And so what this is saying is saying that if the error, if I see a lot of errors, well, these terms will become negative. And alpha, instead of being 10%, it's going to go down. It's going to say, no, use a 95th percentile. Use a 96th percentile. Don't use a 90th percentile. And on the, on the other hand, if this error is zero, then this will go up. And so you will actually try to manually tune and understand which quantile of the empirical distribution of the conformity scores do you want to use. Now, this is interesting because it has an interpretation in terms of online learning. And this is, I'm not expecting people will get this immediately, but you can actually understand this update rule as some form of online convex gradient descent where you introduce a variable beta t, which is the smallest coverage that would contain the observation you've just seen. 
And then this error performs online gradient descent with respect to the pinball loss associated with this beta t variable. All right, and that's going to be important if we if we want to go a little bit beyond the method that I'm going to the method that you see at the top. Now the remarkable thing now is that if I use these updates and I'm looking at the counties being reported from east to west, and so I have a tremendous loss of exchangeability now. The first reporting county is the most eastern in the United States, the second most eastern is the second and so on. And then I guess I'm gonna end up in Hawaii last. When you use this algorithm that use an adaptive alpha, you have the blue curve that you see on the right, which is sort of the local coverage that you get over time as the election night goes on. If you don't adopt alpha, you see these red curves. So you see tremendous loss of coverage having to do with the fact that you lost exchangeability. And you'd say, well, what is this gray curve that you also put? This gray curve is the gray curve we would get if we were in an ideal scenario where the chance of success is 90%. And so what I find remarkable about this blue curve is that this blue curve qualitatively looks like the gray curve. That is a fluctuation around the 90% baseline that you want to achieve looks like what you would get in the ideal scenario where each county you are tossing a coin with probably 90% of success. But if you do not adapt, then you get this, which you see tremendous loss in coverage. Now, there's a lot of theory that we can produce about uh, a method like this. We can show that on average over the long run, your coverage would be exactly 90%. And again, I make no assumption about nothing. There's no assumption whatsoever. Data can drift in arbitrary fashion there's this remarkable result that shows that over the long run, the miscoverage will be almost surely equal to 90%. And so that's a nice result. And when we apply it to a lot of interesting real data set, now we're trying to predict the volatility of stock prices as a function of time. And I don't need to tell you that, you know, 28 was special and 2020 was special. So certainly 2020 is not exchangeable with 2017. Uh, when we actually look at estimates of volatility of stock prices, you know, in red, we are now trying to correct for the distribution shifts. We just apply conformal prediction naively. In blue, we're trying to learn where we should apply conformal prediction. And in green, you, in, in gray, again, you see this sort of gold standard, which would be you, each day you get 90%. Then we can see that we go through tre tre tremendous periods of uh, economic downturns. And yet the prediction interval seem to cover uh, no matter what. And so I'm running out of time. I just want to give you a flavor of what you can do to deal with distribution shifts. Uh, we've done a lot more sophisticated stuff where you'd say, well, you know, Emmanuel, what is this gamma parameter? How do you fix it? He says, well, you don't have to fix it. You can have agents and each of them have their agent, have their own gamma. And you're going to look at the performance of each agent to pick the optimal gamma, so to speak, at any given time, so that you know when to react fast and slow. And so this is, again, bringing in together a lot of ideas in online literature with conformal prediction and inference. And so this method would work even better than the fixed gamma, because now, you know, we have different players and they have all their step size, if you will, of how quickly you should react to errors you've just seen. And then you're going to look at their losses defined by the pinball loss to choose which agent to pick at any given point in time or a combination of agents. And these methods work extremely well in practice. And so we're very happy about this because we think that these are methods that can that are really ready for practical deployment. But I spoke for too long and uh, I want to thank you for your time. I think that I, the case I try to make is that uncertain quantification at a time where we use machine learning to make extremely important decisions is extremely important. We've seen method to perform uncertain yeah. quantification with no assumption whatsoever. Uh, I can see that there's an explosion of interest in academia and industry at the moment. There are thousands of papers on this topic each year. I can see that tech companies are paying very close attention to, to these techniques. 
There are lots of resources available online, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Professor Candice. Uh, we are out of time, so we'll uh, end our talk here, uh, our second installment of the Distinguished Theme Seminar. So thank you, Professor Candice. Uh, Candice, and uh, stop the live stream now. Just a second. Mayor, thank you so much. This is great. Wonderful talk. Thank you.